All right, so we're in Modeler. If we understand how the program works, let's get to the modeling stuff. Let's get let's get started talking about what it actually means to make some stuff in 3D. Let's uh, go ahead and go to one viewport here. I'm gonna go to perspective, blah, 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 gear. Hooray, we made a gear. Um, the way this is set up, there are basically two ways to model things. There's 9,000 ways, but there's basically two ways, two categories of ways to model things. One is you start with primitive objects, like squares and cubes and balls and, you know, cones, things like that, and work your way out, adding detail as you go. If you were to start building a house, you would start with a big box, and then you'd, you know, put the triangle shape on top of the box, and then you start adding more squares for windows, blah, 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 and you build it out, starting with these primitive shapes. The other way of doing it is sort of a sculpting method that you'll see in ZBrush or Mudbox. Uh, if you wanted to be doing stuff like character modeling, if you were interested in that kind of work, uh, I would recommend those programs more than Lightwave for doing it, because those are actually designed for, you know, high-def, smooth body modeling uh, that's more sculpty than it is engineering. Uh, Lightwave is more along the lines of building with Legos. Um, that is to say, uh, if you want to be doing nothing but creatures, go over to ZBrush and work with that. However, a lot of the stuff that you're going to be doing in ZBrush, you're going to want to start with some sort of an object that you've made somewhere else first, like Lightwave, and uh, brought into ZBrush to add detail to later. So this is sort of the only way to start. Box modeling, primitive modeling, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. Primitives are the shapes that are the most useful, that are going to be the most ubiquitous, and you're going to use the most often to start whatever it is you're making. If you're making a calculator, you're going to start with a cube that you've sort of distended or, you know, whatever. If you're making a Rubik's Cube, you're going to start with a cube. If you're making a house, you're going to start with a cube, you know making a globe, you're going to start with, they all sort of start with these basic constituent shapes that are called primitives. Lightwave comes with quite a few, uh, obviously box and ball, you know what those are. Disc would be more like a, a plate, uh, but it can also be more of a pedestal, like a Greek pedestal. Cone is a cone, capsule. And in all of these boxes, um, you have a more, or at least in many of them, you have more. By clicking on that, you get even more. Toroid is a donut, uh, wedge, gear, gemstone, and things like that. Things that you're going to be using constantly up here in the primitives. And you don't have to make a box from scratch. You can use the tool to make the box for you. By clicking on this, uh, I have enacted the box tool. Uh, at this point, my cursor changes to a box. And if I click and drag, I'm going to make a box. Each one of these little blue things is a handle. Uh, once I've drawn that box, clicking and dragging on one of the corners allows me to do this. There are handles on each corner and the center of each face. And they allow me to make you know rather cursory changes to the box. And I can rotate around, again, holding Alt and uh, tweak it as I wish to. But there's actually very few controls to make this box anything more complicated than what I can control from here. Because Lightwave, unlike something like Maya, does not actually keep the um, individual tool controls visible at all times. It, it has uncluttered the workflow and made it a very large viewport. And you can pull up the details menus when you want to. And fortunately, all of the details menus use the exact same shortcut key, N. Hitting the N key, as in Neptune, or clicking the numeric button down here, brings up all the numeric parameters for that tool. That is to say, all the things that you can change, all the things that could be numerically altered, you know, width, height, depth, the center, the axis, the radius, blah, 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 are all available after hitting N. Um, every single tool in Lightwave, you hit N and you get some more tools to play with. Obviously, it has the things that you'd expect to see, like the width and the height and the depth and those things. But it also has this other funny little thing here called a radius. If we zoom in a little bit and I crank the radius, you can kind of see what it does. Oh, I'm in texture mode. Flat shape. You can kind of see what it does. It adds a little bevel to the edge of it. In any case, whatever tool you're using, in this case box, when you're done using it, you hit enter. Now here's what happens when you hit enter. Right now, I can edit this object intelligently. I can still drag the handles, or I can change the shape of the bevel and all that. When I hit Enter, it has been committed. It is now actually part of the geometry, and it's formally there now. In the wireframe mode, there really is these, these points and all this stuff. It's actually a part of the model, which it was not just a second ago. You can think of it in these terms. Uh, right now, I am sort of sending away. I'm, I'm, I'm filling out a form to mail out to the company that makes boxes in 3D and telling them that I want it to be 965 millimeters by 431 by 735 with a radius of 38 millimeters and one radius segment. Um, and I can, if I want to, make a change to it very intelligently. I just going to change what's on the form that I'm sending off. Oh no, actually I want it to be more like this or more like that. You know, I want to make, you know. And you can edit that all you want. But once you hit enter, you sort of send that away and they send you back a box to your specs. 
Now, it's not impossible to edit that box. You can take out some scissors and change the box if you want to. But since they made it a certain way, it's always easier to make it a certain way than it is to edit it into a certain thing. They sent back this box, and now I can edit it if I want to. But it's a little bit more difficult. It's not quite as straightforward as just dragging handles around and stuff like that. So that's the importance of, you know, kind of keeping an eye on when you're making something. And in handle mode, before you have sent off for the thing that you're making, so to speak, uh, make the edits that you want and get as close as you want, can, before you hit enter and commit those things. Because while it's not impossible to edit them, it is a bit more difficult. Now, when I click on any of these tools, let me clear that. When I click on any of these tools, say box, uh, if I just hit in now, it will build the box uh, with whatever I was writing in the numeric panel last time. Um, I don't have to drag and click out to make the box manually. I just you know, hit the box button and in, and it builds that for me. Give me all the things as it was saved last time. One other thing while we're here, I suppose, radius does that beveling thing. Radius segments does this. It basically adds, let's go into wireframe shape, basically adds points in the radius just to add some more detail. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, shit, I mean, look at it. If, it. if it looks kind of OK like that, and better still like this, what's to stop me from just cranking this thing all the way up to you know, 200 or something like that to get it really, really smooth? Um, the answer is nothing. Nothing is stopping you. And the computer will not get in your way to stop you from killing yourself. But you really shouldn't do that. Because there is a upper limit to what your computer can handle, and it's going to be different for every computer, in terms of memory and in terms of how many polygons you're throwing around. Every time you crank up that radius segment, you're adding more and more and more polygons to this thing. Look at how many polygons are in that curve. And while it does look smoother now, you have done that at the expense of a poly count. Ultimately, you're playing with a poly count. The number of polygons that are in this world, there's not necessarily an upper limit, but you're going to find that it works chunkier and chunkier, and it's going to get slower and slower the more polys you have. So you want to be smart about conserving them. And the smartest way to do that is, for instance, to use less polys and use them intelligently than to throw as many polys as possible to make the most detailed cube that ever happened. Now, you do want to be doing stuff like this. You do want to be you know, beveling your edges and all that stuff because nothing in the real world is as perfect as a box is in Lightwave because it's very simply it's the perfect representation of a mathematical cube. It is divided into eight points and six faces. That's all this is. Eight points. You see there's four on top and four on bottom and six faces, that is to say, six polygons being connected by those points. When you are putting together anything in Lightwave, you have various modes to control what you're working with. In this case, let's look at it in smooth shade so you can see these. We have these polygons, right? Each one of these is a polygon, and it is nothing more than four points in space that are connected, and the computer is being told to draw a plane, uh, a plane between them. Each one of these is a polygon. They're connected by edges, like you'd imagine, and ultimately assembled by nothing but points, vertices, apexes, right? Now, you have the ability to edit virtually anything in Lightwave, but because they want to make it a little bit easier to control what it is you are editing, there are three modes of selection to use when you're dealing with a model. Say I want to you know, move this polygon over here or something like that. Well, I need to be in polygon mode to do that. Um, but if I wanted to, you know, move this point. Well, right now, if I click it, oh, shit, I'm not getting that point. That's because right now I'm in polygon mode. Down here at the bottom left, you see it says poly. Uh, by hitting the space bar, I go into points mode, edges mode, polygons mode, and on and on. I can just keep doing this all day long. What that does is it allows me to say, it's easier to tell when I do it like this. Right now in polygon mode, if I click right here, I'm getting the polys. If I click right here, I get the point. It's only going to select what's under your mouse and a point or an edge or a polygon. That is to say, if I wanted to select a point right here, you know, clicking in point mode, there's, there's no points. I mean, there isn't a point right there. All there are are points, you know, here, 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 and here. In point mode, I can only select points. If there are no points right there, I'm not going to select anything. This is basically, it's hard to illustrate a way why this is better than the alternative, but it actually works in your favor all the time. However, if you go space space into polygon mode, you select the poly. And of course, in edge mode, you can select nothing but edges. Whatever. 
we're in box mode, and I was talking about the, the, the importance of using a bevel, even though you don't want to have a really high res one, because nothing in real life is this damn perfect. I mean, it's a 90 degree angle. Nothing is that perfect, and glass isn't that perfect. Now, here's our, our first big cuss word for the whole tutorial series. Phil Tippett, who's a, a puppeteer come uh, visual effects specialist in, in the CG world, has a wonderful saying, the computer is trying to fuck you. Um, what he means by that is, the computer does not want to help you make things look real. You have to make them look real yourself because the computer's intention is just to do the basic whatever command you gave them and it's not going to ask for things like... So seriously, how screwed up did you want that edge to be? You know, look at the edge of the table that you're at right now. It's not perfect. This is. So yeah, we do, for the purposes of making a realistic looking thing, want to throw in a little bit of a bevel on the edge every now and then. But we don't want to, you know, crank it up so high. Even though this looks great, this looks totally real in terms of a smooth bevel. There are smarter ways to do it. We'll get to them later. Ball in, and we get the uh, basic LightWave sphere. There are two ways that you can construct a sphere in LightWave. Um, this is called a globe uh, because it looks quite a bit like a globe. It's broken out into basically latitudinal, latitudinal and longitudinal chunks. Um, and the only point of interest that I'd like to bring up here is, aside from the fact that you can control the number of sides and the number of segments to you know up res as needed uh, i'll hit enter here to commit it the other thing is this style of sphere allows us to talk a little bit about the difference between polygons and triangles this particular version of a ball ends in a pole it ends with triangles all pointing out at one point they all share this one central point at the center of them right one point connected to probably 24 triangles now in lightwave you have the ability to make a polygon that is to say a shape with as many points as you damn well please. I mean, you can make it, you can make a 200 point square if you want to, just by, you know, adding too many points between the actual corner points of a square. And you can, there's nothing stopping you. However, it's an, it's, it's an important habit to get into to as often as possible and as strictly as possible work in nothing but triangles or four point polys, uh, quadrilaterals, because some commands that we're gonna get to later will start getting a little bit mad at you and start drawing things incorrectly and, and perhaps rendering them incorrectly uh, not to mention starting to take a lot longer if you don't work in very simple polygons um, it's just a better habit to be in and the problem is excuse me when you work in higher polygon world uh, you well like I said it can make things run much slower we'll get there later but this is a globe uh, and it does end in a series of triangles at the top if you didn't want it to you could also work in tessellation mode, which is more of a geodesic dome. Once again, now we're getting really into the conversation about what resolution is right for you. Uh, there's one last piece of basic modeling knowledge I want to discuss before we end this video. Um, the, 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 the resolution of what you're working on is something that often you'll want to fake. Uh, instead of working in something like, you know, I can make this sphere so high res that it, it really does look great. Uh, sorry for the sound. It really does look pretty great. I mean, you can see the lines a little bit, but there's actually not much of an argument in favor of working at such high resolution when something like this will be fine if you know the actual tricks of the trade here. Because while, yes, you are actually right now, let's see, looking at it, 266 polygons, and it doesn't look great, and your impulse would be to make many more so you can actually up -res it, there are two ways of controlling what your geometry looks like beyond what the actual geometry is doing. There's, there's two ways of being intelligent about it. One of them is what happens in smooth shade mode using uh, a tool called smoothing, and we'll talk about the surface editor later. What it's doing here, it looks much smoother. I mean, bear in mind, we're not changing the geometry at all. We're just basically alleviating the, the line issue, and we're just kind of smoothing it out. If you look at the silhouette of this ball, you can see that it's still kind of pokey around the edges, but internally, it looks like it's totally smooth. All smoothing is doing is drawing a gradient between all four points to connect it to the plane that's next to it. When you do that across the thing, you end up with what looks much smoother than what you made. So you're basically getting a very smooth ball for free, as opposed to a very smooth ball for all of the time that it's going to take your computer to render something with that many polygons. So a smart way of working around that is just to be aware of the fact that you can work in relatively low resolution and add the smoothness back in later. Don't build it in because it's going to make your it's going to make your computer you got to be smart about it. So that's called being optimal, optimizing your objects. It's just making sure that you're not working at a res higher than you should. 
The other way of doing this is actually altering the geometry a little, although it is only altering it, altering it informally. It's a little hard to explain. Um, I'll do my best. Right now we're looking at the actual object as defined by the polygons assembled in the coordinates, and it's exactly what it is. I have made an object that looks exactly like this, and it's represented fairly, right? Not very smooth, but hey, look, I mean, it's, it's an object. You can also subdivide this object in such a way that the curves smooth out. It's going to, without actually adding geometry, go into thinking about it in terms of adding geometry mode. God, it's impossible to explain subdivision. I'll just show you. When I hit the tab key, I'm going into sub D mode, subdivision mode. I'm going to hit tab now. Look at that. Now, bear in mind, I haven't actually added geometry yet. It's still the comp as complicated as it was. But remember when I was doing even the smoothing? Look at the look at right here at the edge of the ball. Even when smoothing, I don't lose the chunkiness of the silhouette of the ball. But when I go into sub D mode, it really does smooth out significantly. What's happening here is easier to illustrate with a box. What Lightwave is doing, and by the way, I'm going to zero these guys out. When you're in uh, create mode like this, when you have the handles, if you um, just use your arrow keys up and right, uh, you can add things, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, let's go ahead and make this cube five by five by five with, hey, shit. Uh, we'll say three segments each. Basically, we're going to make a Rubik's cube. When I make this cube, um, you can tell, A, it's not smooth at all, but we're, we're comparing it to a ball now. This is the actual geometry. I have made a hollow ball, or I'm sorry, a hollow cube. There aren't lines going in the middle of it. It's just a cube. And it's divided into these subsquares, basically. In sub D mode, a ball will look, and let me scale this up a little bit. In sub D mode, a ball will look like this, right? In sub D mode, a cube will look like this. Hopefully that makes more sense than explaining it does. What it's doing is it's building a fake average to facilitate a curve in all directions for all polygons. Basically, it's just doing its best to do sort of a median averaging and smooth out your object. Now, this is what the object is. This is the geometry, and the geometry does not change when you go into tab mode. It looks like it does. It is displaying it differently, but it is not changing. If you look at the wireframe, the actual points of the corner, like right here, when I hit tab, it stays there because it's still there. It's really still there. It's just smoothing it out based on where the other points are. If I turn on, if I go into my display options by hitting D and turn on cages, cages indicate what the actual cage, the geometry, the mesh is. In sub D mode, it will not line up with the mesh. It will smooth out based on the average distance between the points and all that stuff. But with the with the knowledge of the smoothing tool, which we'll get to in more detail later, and with subdivision mode, you should never have to make anything too high res and bake in that detail. I mean, you could. I could actually bake it like this, and now I have a much more detailed cube, but I haven't actually gained anything because it's literally the same thing. And this way, I have about a, like a sixth as many polygons. No, a ninth. Anyway, um, based on the way the sub-D works. In any case, subdivision is a visualization tool, but you can carry that across all the way into the rendering software, so you never actually have to model as high res if you know that you can tell Lightwave, and by the way, display that in sub-D mode. Uh, it will smooth it out for you without you having to build any actual geometry. So this is the very basics of setting up, you know, primitive objects in Lightwave, uh, box ball, and how they control the numeric panel, and what sub-D is. All of this stuff actually does belong in the same beginning foundational group because things are going to get a little bit more complicated moving on. But there's the beginning of modeler and the beginning of modeling. And we'll see you in a second to talk a little bit more about the, the fun stuff in modeling.